All right, let's take our Bibles and go to Joshua chapter 3 tonight. <clears throat> we in Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Joshua chapter 3, reading verses 1 through 7. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. It came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way uh, heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant, and went before the people." And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again we ask that you would bless our time, bless the reading of your word. Father, we need to hear from heaven tonight. Lord, we need our hearts to be spoken to. Father, we need our thoughts to be established. Lord, you said that if we committed our ways unto you, you would establish our thoughts. And Lord, we, it's the middle of the week. Our minds are uh, full of other thoughts. There are things that can distract us from your word tonight, what you want to do in our hearts tonight. We ask that you would remove all distractions. Help us, Lord, to be, be completely focused on you tonight. Because, Lord, I know that you have something for each and every one of us. And I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, help us to have ears to hear, a heart to receive. Lord, help us to even hold on to the things that you speak to our hearts about. Father, I ask that you would, as always, help us, Lord, to lift up Jesus Christ and bring honor and glory to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Very familiar with Joshua and the fact that Joshua is the second leader after Moses. God had sent Moses back to Egypt to lead his people out of slavery and uh, obviously to be a representation of God. As he spoke to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And, and God obviously showed his power there in Egypt. And he brought the people out with a mighty hand. Uh, he allowed them to spoil the Egyptians as the Egyptians on that last plague where the firstborn died. And God had, uh, had Moses tell the people, you know, kill a lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. And when he sees the blood, he would pass over, the death angel would pass over every dwelling place that had the blood applied to the doorpost. And they came out with a mighty hand. I mean, God gave them victory and, uh, and they were just excited because they finally were free, yet not too long, three days into the wilderness, they started complaining uh, about, you know, being better off in Egypt, you know, remembering the leeks and the onions. And, and God was gracious, and God, God brought them through, brought them across the Red Sea. I mean, because God had promised he was going to bring them into the promised land. But unfortunately, that first generation, the older generation, gets to the promised land, and they decide they don't want to go in. You had ten men who went in, Besides Joshua and Caleb, the ten men that went in saw the same land, saw everything that Joshua and Caleb saw, yet they came back with an evil report saying, you know what, it's a land that eats up the inhabitants. There's no way that we can get victory in this land. Now Joshua and Caleb, they, they encouraged the people and said that, that those giants were bred for them, that God would give them the victory. But that generation rebelled against God, they didn't trust God. They caused the rest of the people to rebel against God and not to go into the promised land, a place that God had promised that he would give to them. So what happens? They end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And now we come to the place where Joshua, because he was so faithful to God, okay, you see, he ministered to the man of God. He trusted God. He believed God. Now God has chosen him to be the next leader to lead the next generation into the promised land. And this is where we're at. They are preparing to go into the promised land. And how exciting 
After 40 years, Joshua is still remaining faithful to God, still trusting God. And tonight's title of the message is Continuing in the Will of God. Because it was God's will for them to go into the promised land, but because of other people, because of other people's rebellion and, and unbelief, Joshua has to wander in the wilderness for 40 years before receiving the blessing of the Lord, before entering in that promised land. Now, life is tough. Last year, 2020 was tough. Uh, this year, 2021 is tough. Because you know what? We live in a world that is sin-cursed. Now, there are blessings to be had, and God blesses his people in this world. I mean, if you're a child of God tonight, you have experienced the blessings of God. You've tasted the goodness of God. But we still have human flesh that wants to do its own thing, go against the will of God. And we have to submit and yield ourselves to the Spirit of God and allow ourselves to continue to believe where we don't understand. That's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Even though we don't understand, God says, trust me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And Joshua acknowledged that God was in control of his life. And what I want us to see tonight, that even after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Joshua continues in the will of God. Even though he's had to wait, yet you know what? He had something to look forward to. You and I have something to look forward to. We have a promised land. We have heaven to look forward to tonight. So no matter what difficulties may come in our life, no matter what setbacks we may have, we know that if God has called us to a place, called us to a ministry, has had any type of calling in our life, that we're not there yet, we know it will come to pass if we will just faithfully trust and follow God. Because if it's God's calling, it will come to pass. And God wanted his people in the promised land. So there's a couple of things I want us to learn from the scriptures tonight in Joshua chapter 3. I mean, obviously, continuing in God's will, even when it's difficult, even when you don't see the outcome, trusting that, obviously, God's timetable is always right. God's always on time. God's always working things out. And obviously, with Joshua, 40 years, for that rebellious generation to die off, for the young generation, the kids to grow up to be the ones that go into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. But just thinking about this tonight and starting off with the fact that we have to pursue God's plan. You know what God has for you in your life. You know what God's plan is for you. If you don't, seek him for it, ask him for it, because he will show you his plan. He's got a plan for each and every one of his children. But you look at verse 1, Joshua rose early in the morning, they removed from Shittim, came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. First thing I want you to think about in pursuing God's plan is Joshua had some anticipation. He's been anticipating this moment for 40 years. Now can you imagine the disappointment if we were to go back and look at the Exodus and look at that moment where Joshua and Caleb, they come back I mean, they tell Moses, it's exactly the way God said it was. I mean, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, these, he is excited. You know what? He knows there's giants there, but he's focused on the goodness of God. He's focused on the fact that God said it was a land that will provide for our families. Two men are carrying the cluster of grapes back because the cluster of grapes were so huge. I mean, what God said is true. God is not a man that he should lie. If God says it's good, it's good. Okay, now God didn't tell them that there were giants in the land because you know what? God's not worried about the giants. He's not worried about the difficulties or the hardships because there's nothing that God cannot give us victory over. We can do all things through Christ which strengthen us, but Joshua had some anticipation. I mean, he knew at some point God was going to allow them to go in. God kept Joshua alive those 40 years. Joshua is now 80 years old. He's getting ready to go in the promised land. But he's got some anticipation. I want you to notice these words in verse 1. And Joshua rose early in the morning. Early in the morning. You know, you see that several times in scriptures. Abraham rose early in the morning. 
when God told him to sacrifice his son Isaac. He rose up early in the morning to get to the place that God wanted him to get to with his son Isaac. You know what? When, when you have the anticipation of God working in your day and your week, there needs to be that getting up early. Because you know that God's going to do something. Joshua knew God was going to do something. It, it was now time for them to head into the promised land. But they had to let God lead them. I'm sure Joshua was, was biting at the bit to get to the promised land. I mean, have you ever been so excited about being able to do something or go somewhere and you just couldn't wait till it happened and you had to wait, you know, until just, you know, until that right moment to, to do it or to go, but you're anticipating on getting there. You're anticipating on God doing a great work, God giving you victory, God getting you over the Jordan River, something that's, that's a barrier, something that you can't remove, but God removes it. God calls the, sets the waters back when the priests set their feet down in the Jordan River, all right? But the anticipation, the anticipation of what God's going to do. So he rose up early in the morning, ready, excited for what God was going to do. Keep a finger here and go to Mark chapter 1. Abraham rose up early in the morning for what God was going to do in his life, but we look at Jesus Christ and the reason why he rose up early in the morning and obviously you do as well. <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, and I say you do as well because as far as what Jesus does here, he's our example, and this is what we do to start the day off. Because every day we should have anticipation God's going to do something. Yeah, but pastor, I'm going to work tomorrow. God can still do a great work at your work. God can still, he still wants to do great things, all right? No matter how bad the work may be or the job may be or the co-workers or the boss may be, God can still do great and mighty things. We have to yield ourselves to him and let him work in us and through us, okay? But Jesus in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, And in the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Now we know Joshua was a man of prayer because you move on from, from where we're at in John chapter 3, when it's time to cross over the Jordan River at nighttime, Joshua goes out, and he's met by someone that he's not sure who he is. Are you for us or against us? And he hears, he hears that, that person say, neither. He's the captain of the heavenly host. And he meets the Lord Jesus Christ that night, and he gets the battle plan for Jericho. All right, Joshua, being a man of prayer, someone who's relying on the Lord, he's anticipating what God's going to do, but he rises up early in the morning because he wants to be ready, he wants to prepare, he wants to, to spend some time with the Lord. Every day of our life, listen, we should anticipate God doing something. Now, I'm glad that God speaks to us when, as a body of believers, we gather together and, and, and God promised, Jesus promised, where two or more gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And we're glad for that. But every day, God wants to do something in our life. Because you know what? He has begun a good work in us and will continue that good work. He wants to do great things in our life. And there are things I think many Christians, many Bible-believing Christians are missing out on because they're not seeking God. They're not continuing in God's will. Joshua knows God's will for his people at this moment is to go into the promised land. He's finally brought them back around to that place to be able to go in and see the hand of God, the power of God, working for them and against the enemies. Now, Joshua had a faith focused on what God could do. Joshua knew God could do this, that God could do anything. And we need to have a faith that's focused on what God can do, not what we're facing Joshua has not forgotten what's in the promised land. He knows there's giants there. He knows there's difficulties and hardships there. But he is trusting in the power of God, the promises of God, because Joshua saw the power of God bring them out of Egypt, right? Slaver for 400 plus years, God brings out with a mighty hand. Joshua was part of that. He saw the hand of God. And jo let me just back up and say this. Joshua and Caleb did not allow the other ten men to pull their faith down. 
He didn't allow the other ten men to corrupt them. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The rest of the people allowed their faith to be diminished by what these men were saying. And Joshua tried encouraging them, saying, no, God's on our side. God will give us victory. And you know what? Sometimes there are those that will go with the wrong crowd and the wrong thinking and the unbelief. But don't allow your belief and your faith in God to diminish. Don't allow yourself to be affected by others who are not trusting in God and not believing in God and are fearful. Okay? Now, talking about the laws, there are, there are Christians that they're fickled. They're fickled. They're babies in Christ. They haven't grown in their faith. All right? But that's why we need to continue in God's will. God's will for each and every one of us is to continue growing in our faith, keep our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith, keep moving forward in the direction that he's leading us. We're to follow. Remember, Jesus would come by different men in the gospel and say, follow me. That's all he said, follow me. And they had a choice to get up and follow. And praise the Lord, many did follow Christ, and you have followed Christ as well. Let's continue on following in God's will. But not only was he focused on what God could do, but he, he had a faith in God to deliver the people in the promised land that God was going to bring them into the promised land like he said. Do you believe all the promises in God's word? Sometimes you've got to wait for the promise to come to pass. But again, God's not a man that he should lie. God always brings his promises to pass. To pass. If we will follow in faith and we will lean upon him and keep, keep a yielded life. And just, again, when we don't see how it's going to work out, again, Joshua, 40 years in the wilderness. Can you imagine the temptations coming that, you know what, this is never going to end. This is never going to end. I'm never going to see the promised land. But guess what? Obviously, Joshua kept his faith. He kept a right focus. And we have to keep a right focus and a right faith. Again, we have a promised land that we're looking to, and that's heaven. And between this moment and the moment we see Christ face to face, there's going to be trials. There's going to be difficulties. There are going to be people trying to pull you down, trying to, trying to put fire on, or put water on your faith, try to, try to throw water on that fire that, that you have and that zeal and that determination you have. Because misery loves company. But don't allow yourself to be affected by misery or by unbelief. Allow yourself to be affected by the Holy Spirit of God who's in you that's always encouraging you and always saying, hey, keep looking ahead. Look unto the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help cometh from the Lord. Keep focused on the author and finisher of your faith. Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 4. First John chapter 5, verse number 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now the world will continue to be wicked, continue to be anti-Christ, but our faith in Christ overcomes the world. Jesus gives us that victory. So don't allow difficult times or uncertainties Keep you from moving forward and continuing in the will of God. God's will for each of his children is to keep the faith. Now, we look at Paul. I think Paul's a great example. You study the life of Paul, and we even looked at this on Sunday, and we kind of looked at Paul's testimony where he testified of, uh, of being beaten several times, uh, being shipwrecked in prison, stoned. I mean, all the things he faced as a child of God in the center of God's will. Being a missionary, being an apostle to the Gentiles, everywhere he went, he was doing God's will. He faced opposition. But at the end of his life, he writes to Timothy and says, I've kept the faith. I have finished my course. Not because he was some strong super Christian, but because his strength was in Christ. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ said, in your weakness, I'm strong. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Even though... He had a thorn in the flesh. He asked for it to be removed, yet the Lord didn't remove it. But he said, my strength will help you to keep pressing on. Now, the, again, 
Sometimes we do have thorns in the flesh. Sometimes there are things that we want God to remove. Lord, if you take this away, I can serve you better. I don't know what Joshua's thoughts are, were, but I know if I was there on that day when all those men, when those ten men were discouraging everybody, and Joshua understands that, you know what, God's not going to let us go into promised land. I would have been screaming, Lord, at least me go in. Let me, my family go in because, Lord, I have faith in you. I don't want to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Joshua gets the same sentence as the rest of the people, 40 years in the wilderness. But, Lord, I had the faith. I know you can do this. Why do I have to suffer 40 years in the wilderness with everybody else? Think about, again, the world that we live in. There are things that we suffer. Again, you think about last year and how crazy society got and how crazy things got in our country where things were, things were shut down. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. I mean, just, again, society and, and the world trying to oppress us. Yet for most of God's people, they didn't lose faith. They didn't lose hope. They just kept pressing on and making the best of it. And just keep serving God and having the right focus. And that's Joshua. He had the right focus. His focus was on God and what God could do. So on that morning in Joshua chapter 3 verse 1, he rose up early because it was a new day. It was a new beginning. God was about to deliver them into the promised land in a great and mighty way. I want you to look at verse 1 again. <laughs> All right. And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. So he rises up early in the morning, and then he leads all the people away from Shittim there to the Jordan River. That's, it's about five miles, from what I can find out, from Shittim to the Jordan River. They're five miles from it. Now they move from Shittim, where they were camped out, they, they pull up their stakes, they, they gather up their tents, their families, they move to where God's working. They move to the place, to the Jordan River, where God is about to do a great work. And God is about to show himself powerful. He's about to encourage them. He's about to deliver them again into the promised land. They've been waiting for this moment. Again, I don't know... Again, how, all, how everything happened. But when you think about 40 years in the wilderness, you got these little children growing up, seeing their parents die off, their grandparents die off. Those that didn't trust the Lord, those that had disbelief. You got Joshua, Caleb, their families. You know, those that, that were trusting the Lord and following the Lord. Probably talking to these kids as they're growing up. And there's coming a day. God's going to deliver us into the promised land. God's going to come through. God's going to bless you. You're going to be the generation that goes in, teaching them the word of God, the promise of God. You know what? You're the generation that God's going to do a great work in and through. And we need to. We need to teach the next generation that God has promises for them, that God's going to do a great work in their life. But they remove themselves from Shittim. They go down to the Jordan Banks, you think about it, a faith-filled believer will always say, let's move to where God's working. Let's move to where God's working. Now, that doesn't always necessarily mean move from where you're living somewhere else. Now, if God calls you to be a missionary, you know that's where he wants you to go. All right? But it's not always moving from place to place, moving from where you're at spiritually. Again, a, a lot of people's faith have diminished over the past year, over the past year and a half. They haven't gotten back to where they were. That's, that's moving away from Shittim and going to where God is and where God wants you to be. God wants them at the Jordan banks. God wants them to continue in his will. Sometimes we have disbelief and unbelief. Sometimes, we, again, we allow circumstances to weigh heavy upon us, and God wants us to cast that off and to follow him. There's an account in Scripture 
We know, we know this man is blind Bartimaeus. And as Jesus is coming through the town, and he hears it's Jesus coming through the town, he's crying out, Thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And the people try hushing him and say, Shh, be quiet. But the more they say be quiet, the more he calls out. And Jesus stops, calls him to him. And the Bible records that Bartimaeus cast off the coat that was on him. It's kind of a picture. He's been blind. He's been in this state of mind. He's been in this physical state. He's been in this place for so long. But he hears Christ. And they bring him to Christ because Christ wants him to come where he's at. And he casts off that outer garment and goes to where Christ is. And he receives sight. Saying something, we've got to cast off the spiritual slothfulness. We've got to cast off the disbelief. Whatever it is that's hindering us and holding us back, we know where God wants us to go. God wants us to move forward. So we've got to cast that off and move to where God is working. Notice they, they were moved from Shittim. They came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there. They set up camp right where God wanted them to be. I mean, they... They put their stakes down until it was time for God to move them again. Wherever God plants you is right where you need to blossom. Where God plants you is where you need to, you need to put your roots in and allow God to work in you and through you. There's blessings to be had in the center of God's will. Again, I, 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 feel, I feel bad for those that are missing out on the blessings of God. They're missing out on what God wants to do. The Bible's still true. God's, God's looking to show himself great and mighty in the lives of his people. He's looking for people that he can show himself great and mighty. And Joshua was a man that wanted God to work in his life, wanted God to work in the lives of his people. You think about, look at verse number three, if you would, Again, pursuing God's plan, pursuing God. In verse number two, we see <clears throat> the priority for God's people. There's some things that God's people need to do. Now, they're in a place where God wants them to be. They're following Joshua. Joshua is the leader. He's moved them from Shittim to the Jordan banks. No doubt he, he has been encouraging them in what God's going to do. He's probably been telling, the, telling those kids as they were growing up and now they are the adults to go in about how wonderful the promised land is. It's exactly the way God said it was. God's going to do great and mighty things for us. God's going to give us victory in this land. I mean, it's going to be wonderful. You're going to see God working. And they're all anticipating it. And they're all excited. They're there. They're moving. They're there at the Jordan Bakes. They can't wait. They don't know what the step, next step is. They're just waiting but there's some things to be done. You look at verse number three. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. So they're told, okay, we're here. Now when you see the priests bearing the ark of the covenant, you follow it. You follow it, you go after it. A couple things I want to remind us about the Ark of the Covenant. Again, they're told to focus on that covenant. Focus on that Ark. When you see it, keep your eyes on it, go after it, and follow it. Why? What's in the Ark? Let's remember a couple of things that are in the Ark. The first thing is, what's in that Ark are the table of stones that were given to Moses that have the commandments of God on it. The Word of God. The word of God is in that ark. And they were to follow the word of God. They were to keep their focus on the word of God because the word of God will never lead you astray. Remember the ark of the covenant. Again, you read on, they were supposed to follow it everywhere it went because God tells them, you haven't gone this way before. This is not a way that you know. So keep your eye on the ark of the covenant. It's going to lead you because my word, my word is there. My word is going to lead you. I want you to look at a couple places. Look at Exodus chapter 30. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 30. And the Ark of the Covenant was very important to God's people in the day. They reverenced that Ark. 
That was a picture of God's presence. Now, when they came out of Egypt, God's presence led them in a pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day. Now, he gives them this Ark of the Covenant made of, made of wood, overlaid with gold, has the mercy seat on it. Again, has the table of stones in it, has, has the rod, Aaron's rod that budded in it, has, uh, has the, uh, the, uh, the golden pot with the manna in it. Obviously, the mercy seat on top. But this Ark of the Covenant, Exodus 30 and um, verse number 6, if you would. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the Ark of the Testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. Speaking about the presence of God, all right? They will meet with thee. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10 and verse 33. Numbers chapter 10 and verse 33. Uh, Hold on. Yes, verse 33. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. The ark of the covenant went before them. Again, it's we are to be following the Lord, we're we'll following His Word, allowing His Word, right? Word of God's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Again, some Christians are not following the Word of God. They're not allowing the Word of God to guide them. And this is what God's given us, His Word. So the Word of God in the Ark of the Covenant, they were to keep their eyes upon it. They were to be focused on it, follow it everywhere it leads them, right? A lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, guiding us. Guiding us according to God's will, where God wants us to go, where God wants us to serve, all right? Where God wants us to bring honor and glory to Him, where He wants us to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Word of God is to be our focus. But also in that Ark of Covenant is the golden pot of manna. And manna represented the bread of life. Because remember, when, when God's people were out there and they needed food, God gave them manna from heaven. Oh, and they loved him. It provided for them. I mean, it, was, it, was, it had all the nutrients they needed. But obviously, at some point, they started complaining against the manna. They said, we loathe this manna. We're tired of it. We want something different. So God gave them quail and choked, as the Bible says, the fattest of them. He choked the rebellious. He choked those that, that were so full of themselves instead of full of the Lord. All right, but again, focus on the Ark of the Covenant. Go after it. Follow my word. Follow Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. Keep your focus on the author and finisher of your faith. Follow. Follow these things because they will not lead you astray. My word's not going to lead you astray. My son and your savior's not going to lead you astray, right? And then on top of that Ark was the mercy seat. God showed mercy to that generation. Now he's leading them into the promise and follow me. Aren't you glad there's mercy with the Lord? That even when you make a mistake and you come to the Lord with a repentant heart and asking the Lord forgiveness, he has mercy. Not only when you mess up, but think about the fact that before you were saved. And you came to Jesus Christ and asked for forgiveness and asked Christ to come into your life. And he came into your life. The love, the grace, the mercy. So the mercy, you're following a merciful Savior. You're following the word of God. You're following Jesus Christ who is a merciful Savior. Not a merciful Savior, but he's a merciful burden bearer. As the Bible says, cast your care upon him for he careth for you. They have no idea what to expect in the promised land. All they know is God says, through Joshua, follow the Ark of the Covenant. Keep your eyes on it. Keep trusting in the Word of God. Keep trusting in the bread of life, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep trusting in the mercy of God. That God is merciful. God's giving them another chance to follow, and to go into the promised land. I'm glad that we serve a Savior and a God of second chances. Hey, you messed up? 
God brings it back around. Now, I never did, again, like taking tests in school. There were times, looking back, I wish I could have, you know, done a second round just to make some, some better grades. You know, fail a test and, well, that's it. That's, that's the grade you get. I'm glad that God gives second chances. I'm glad that when, again, it's not Joshua that wouldn't go in the promised land. It was others. But God brings Joshua back around with Caleb, with, that, with the children that have grown up, brings them back around. Here's the second time to be able to go into the promised land. Second time to follow the Lord. Second time to trust the Lord, to have faith in him and faith in his promises and in his power. Why don't you look at Psalm 112, verse 7. Psalm 112 and verse number 7. Psalm 112, verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Again, Joshua's heart was fixed, trusting in the Lord. Again, he was not, as he says, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. He didn't allow himself to be affected by what others said. Here he is, and God's faithful. God kept Joshua alive. God's now allowing him to lead his people into the promised land. Again, there are blessings to be had. There are, there are things that God wants to do in our lives. We have to faithfully keep continuing in his will. His will is for us to faithfully follow, to faithfully trust him, to faithfully believe that God will do what he said he will do. So look back very quickly at verse number three again at Joshua. Joshua chapter three, verse number three. Again, thy command, uh, they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. So keep your eyes on the Ark of the Covenant, the precious things that are in the Ark, on the Ark. Those would be your focus, guiding you. But you have to follow. Go after it. Go after it. Again, Hebrews 12, 12, again, tells us, keeping your eyes on the author and finisher of your faith. Because you know what? Jesus will guide you. He will lead you in me according to the Father's perfect will. Jesus is all about the Father's perfect will. Even though in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know what? There are difficult things in life where we're like, Lord, can you just remove this? Lord, can you change this? Don't allow yourself to be like those that walk away from God when he doesn't change it. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to remind you that God has a purpose for it if he hasn't removed it. God's going to use it for good in your life. God's going to help you to get over to the other side. Because again, I mean, when you think about it, they're there at the Jordan River. It's not a creek. It's not something you can just jump over. If I remember correctly, I think at the time that they're here is at the time, yeah, it's at the time the Jordan River overflows its banks. So it's even wider than it normally is. So here, they've moved from Shittim. They've moved from, from a place, uh, we can say a place of doubt, unbelief, a place of, you know, uh, oh, what do I want to say? Complacent. Place of complacent. Well, we're kind of used to this place. Now they've moved because they know this is where God wants, but wait a minute, now we're faced with something that we can't change. Something that we can't overtake ourselves. Now, why would God move us from there to here in another place that seems like we're between a rock and a hard place? Promised land is over there, but how are we going to get there? That's the way God works because it's God who, who does the work. It's God who moves us. And obviously, it's God who parts the Jordan River. Obviously, the priests have to walk by faith, putting their feet in the water as they're told to do. And the Jordan River parts. Saying it's trusting the Lord. 
So you look with me at, uh, very quickly, Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. And let me just even say this tonight. Don't allow yourself just to think of, okay, well, God hasn't asked me to go anywhere. God hasn't asked me to, to move physically from one place to another, but spiritually, again, there are places spiritually we need to move away from. There are, again, promises that maybe we have gotten to the point where we stopped believing. Well, I know God can, but it's been so long, I don't think he's going to. Again, in all of our lives, there will be, has been, and maybe currently, difficulties. Things that you wish were different. Circumstances you wish you weren't in. And it's a whole host of, of a list I could, could name out, and I won't. Because I'm sure the Holy Spirit of God can tell each and every one of us where we're at spiritually and where we need to move. What's holding us back that we need to let go of so we can go forward where God wants us to be. But here's the key, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Jesus Christ has given himself a sacrifice for you. He sacrificed himself on the cross of Calvary, not just for your sin, but that you could have an abundance of life, that you could have a new life as well as me, and be able to willingly follow him now. As a child of God, we have that liberty to willingly follow Christ where he leads us and to allow him to work in our life and to do his perfect will in our life. Will others agree? Not always. Will others get on board with you? Not always. But if we individually choose to go where God wants us to go and do what God wants us to do, God will bless. And we will see the hand of God working in our life. Don't worry about those that may not follow or those that may not agree or get on board with you. We always want to make sure we're in line and right with him. That was Joshua. Again, he chose, Joshua and Caleb, they chose not to listen to the other ten. And even though they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, waiting, they never lost hope. Because in fact, just kind of jumping to Caleb, when it finally comes to Caleb, Caleb Caleb comes to Joshua and says, you know, God said I could have that mountain. That was my mountain, and I want it. So Caleb had to wait too, but he never forgot the fact that God said you can have that land. Never lose hope in your Savior. Never lose hope in God. Now, lastly, look at verse 5. Verse number 5. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Joshua tells them, okay, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, get up and follow it. Go after it. Keep your eye on it. But then he tells them, you need to sanctify yourself. For tomorrow, God's going to do a great work. God's going to do wonders among you. But you need to sanctify yourself first. Again, God wants to do great wonders among his people and in your life, but there may be things in our life that we have to sanctify ourselves from. Things that we have to get rid of in order for God to do what he wants to do in our life. So how do you prepare for the power of God? Joshua's telling him to prepare for what God's going to do. Prepare for the power of God in your life. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Because he says, sanctify yourselves. Get your heart ready. Sanctify means get your heart ready. Now, now there's a sanctification that the Lord's doing in us. All right. But we also are called to sanctify ourselves. 
the things that we know are not right, things that we know that are a hindrance, things that we know that probably are not pleasing to the Lord. I mean, the Holy Spirit's even told us, hey, you know what? Stop doing that. Stop watching that. Stop listening to that. Because we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit of God. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God in our life because the Holy Spirit of God guides us and leads us according to the will of God. We have to prepare ourselves for the power of God in our life. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, uh, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. I mean, so God wants us to be holy. He wants us to have a holy living. That's not, I'll, I'll be honest, it's not popular for today. It's not popular when you, t- when you talk to people and tell people, you know, that God wants you to live a holy life. Well, I... I I'm not Christ. I can't be sinless. It's not about being sinless. It's about living a life that brings honor and glory to the Lord. And yes, it's a life of not doing what we used to do. All right. We can say not drinking, smoking, doing drugs, cursing. But what about, as well, sanctifying our hearts because of unbelief or doubt, fear, lust? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So it's sanctifying ourselves, and we want the power of God in our life. And look, there, think about this. Peter said he would not deny the Lord. He said, though all men deny you, I will not deny you. And like I've said before, I believe that Peter had a love for Christ. He's thinking, there's no way, Lord. I've walked with you three and a half years. There's no way I'm going to deny you. But that was mixed with a little pride because the Lord obviously warned him and said, you're going to deny me. And Peter didn't ask for the Lord, well, help me not to. Lord, if you know I am, then please keep me from it. All right. So when we're told by the Spirit of God that there's something we need to get rid of, something we need to change, instead of arguing with the Lord, instead of justifying it, we say, yes, Lord, obviously you know all things. You know if this is something that's going to keep me from moving forward. This is going to keep me from trusting you. So, Lord, help me to remove it, whatever it is. Lord, I give it to you. Again, if it's something in our heart, all right, some some thinking that we have that's not right. If it's physical actions, Lord, whatever it is, help me, Lord, because I want to be ready for your power to be in my life. I want the power of God upon my life. What did Paul say when the Lord said, my grace is sufficient? Paul said, I'd rather glory in my infirmities. Was Paul crazy? He'd rather glory in being stoned and shipwrecked and beaten. He wasn't crazy. Remember what he said? I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So he didn't allow himself to get mad or bitter because the thorn wasn't being removed. He allowed his focus to be on the Lord. He allowed his focus to be on Christ and said, well, if that's the only way I can have the power of God upon my life, then I will surrender myself to it, yield to it. I'll glory in it that the power of Christ may rest upon my life. So Paul had a right heart, a right attitude, a right motive. And obviously you see in scriptures the testimony of Paul's life, power of Christ was on his life. We need the power of Christ on our life as well. And we're called to sanctify ourselves in order to see that. Again, what caused the older generation not to go into the promised land? But to die in the wilderness, a heart of unbelief and rebellion. Heart of unbelief and rebellion. Very quickly, do you think about this? Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. How do we sanctify ourselves then? God's doing a work in us. God's sanctifying us, all right? The sanctification, but how can we do it as well? Through cleansing. Ephesians chapter 5. There's one way that you and I can cleanse our thinking and even our hearts, and that is through the Word of God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. <clears throat> that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. Remember, Jesus even said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So it's the Word of God. Their focus, remember, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, go after it. 
Ark of the Covenant was holding the Word of God. You and I are holding the Word of God. We have a copy of it. Go after it. Allow it to sanctify you and cleanse your heart so that we will be right with the Lord and we can have more blessings and more of the power of God in our lives so we can continue in the will of God for our lives. Not only through the cleansing of God's word, but also through faith in God. Look, if you would, at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And all this is exactly what the children of Israel were to do. They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now God was bringing them to the entrance of the promised land, but they had to do exactly what the other generation had a chance to do, and that was to choose to trust God and follow him into the promised land. Hebrews 11, verse 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We know that verse. We can quote that verse. But we have to apply that verse. Lord, I don't understand. I don't see how I'm going to get there. But we're trusting you, Lord, that you'll get us there at the right time. We're trusting that you'll part that Jordan River so we can walk across on dry land. Lord, I just want to be in the center of your will. You know, the safest place to be, and you've heard this, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Yeah, but what about on the Mediterranean Sea, in the midst of a storm where the sun hasn't shone for 14 days? That was Paul on the ship headed to Rome as a prisoner, right? Why would God allow his man to be a prisoner on a boat that looks like it's going to be destroyed, all lives are going to be lost? Because God's in control. God's in control of his nature. And obviously God had that storm rise up because God needed Paul to get to the island of Melita before going to Rome. What I'm saying is the safest place to be is in the center of God's will, even if there is a storm around you. Disciples on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus Christ is the one that sent them across. He's the one that sent them knowing the storm was going to rise up. Yet they're in the center of his will. We have to choose to either have faith or not have faith. But aren't you glad that when you have a little bit of unbelief, and you cry out like Peter did, Lord, save me as he was sinking. The Lord's right there to lift him up and walk with him back to the boat. Remember, because that father said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's sanctifying yourself. You know what your struggles are. You know if you have unbelief. You know if there's just things holding you back, and you've got to be honest with the Lord. Lord, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. Lord, you know I'm struggling here. And I know that you can, but Lord, would you help me to get victory over this mindset, whatever it is? Lord, would you help me just to get victory over it? And I'm glad, again, the Lord is a God of mercy who doesn't say, no, because you don't have unbelief, I'm not going to help you. He says, yes, I'll help you because you you confessed your sin of unbelief. We serve a wonderful Savior. Verse number two, though, I want to leave it there. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, For by it, the elders obtained a good report. We want to have a good report with the Lord because of our faith. We want to continue in the will of God as he leads us. Again, I'm trusting God to do great and mighty things, not just in my life, but through his church, through all of his churches, through all of his people. You know what? I'm trusting that he's going to do great and mighty things here. Last place I want you to look at, uh, look at verse 7. Go back to Joshua chapter 3 and just look at verse 7. We'll end here. Obviously, Joshua, he leads the people from Shittim to the Jordan banks. They're getting ready to go on the promised land. The people are told, follow the Ark of the Covenant, keep your eyes on it, focus, go after it. But before you do, Sanctify yourself. Make sure there's nothing between you and your Savior. Make sure you're not harboring iniquity in your heart. Make sure things are right with the Lord. And then, notice in verse number 7. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Now as God does great things 
through the leadership of Joshua. So the people see that God's hand is on Joshua as it was on Moses. We also want that same testimony that God is with us. Now we know you're saved. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But again, when we grieve and quench the Holy Spirit of God, we don't hear his voice. We don't feel his presence. We can't acknowledge his leading. Paul was very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul wanted to go into a certain part of Asia, and the Holy Spirit forbade him. And Paul didn't resist it. Paul knew it was a leading of the Holy Spirit and not the devil trying to get him not to go spread the gospel. Being very sensitive to the Lord, there's no confusion. You'll know, even if it's something that is right, you'll know if it's God telling you, not now. Because Paul was able to go in later. So continuing in the will of God, applying the principle of God's word to our life that, you know what? I want God to continue to be in my life, guiding me, leading me according to his will. So I'm going to continue following his word, continue following the Savior who has given me life, and continue focused on the Lord, trusting that his perfect will is where I need to be. Again, have no idea what God has in store each and every day, but we know that God is in each and every day that we face. So rising up early in the morning to, to ask the Lord to, to guide us and to lead us, asking the Lord to help us to be in the center of his will, and helping us, obviously, to have his power upon our life so others will see it, so we can influence others. Joshua was an influencer. He was able to influence the people to follow him as he followed the Lord. That's what Paul said, right? Follow me as I follow the Lord. That's exactly what we want to do. Let's have a word of